when you fight for something and again it's just taken away from you just like that so you think like what else can just be taken away from me it came to a point where I, I you know I did want to commit suicide it was anxiety and I've never had anxiety before but it's all linked with with the property Where we live can influence our health and well-being. There are more than four million leasehold properties in England and Wales, but in recent years, a groundswell of complaints have emerged that some developers and freeholders are imposing doubling ground rents, high or unclear service charges and one-off bills. Leasehold is the main form of tenure for flats in England and Wales. That means the freeholder owns the land and everything on it. And owning a lease allows you to live in the property for a set period of time with many restrictions. Even though leaseholds are typically between 99 and 125 years, the value of the lease reduces over time and it can cost the leaseholder tens of thousands of pounds to extend it. In effect, a leasehold owner is in a tenant and landlord relationship with the freeholder and some leaseholders say they've been charged unreasonably high fees to make alterations to the property. I will never purchase something in these conditions. Wow. I'm meeting Lisa, who's asked us not to use her real name. The flat she bought in 2007 is being repossessed and she's found the experience traumatic, so doesn't want to be identified. In 2013, all 21 flats in Lisa's block were served an invoice for major works, initially totalling just short of £100,000 between them. But she says damp problems appeared and progressively got worse once the works began. I was in the process of actually um, selling my flat. I had a buyer I exchanged and November 2013, the same week I exchanged, they sent another letter, an invoice about works and from £100,000 it went up to roughly 600000 My buyers, uh, you know, they didn't want it anymore and I, I couldn't afford to go to court for that and stuff like that because I was already in an emotional state. Lisa's portion of the £600,000 came to around 50000 By law, leaseholders must be consulted on service charges before any works are carried out, but the freeholder of Lisa's block took them to tribunal. They won the case, which allowed them to do away with the consultation and enforce the works due to the condition of the building. So we lost the case, unfortunately. And then what happened was my mortgage company paid them. You know, my mortgage went up another about £600. There's no equity to the flat because the flat is not even fixed yet. So how long can I do this for? I, I couldn't even be in that flat anymore because it depressed me so much. And in the meantime, I'm struggling. I'm on antidepressants. I'm going to a therapist. Everything's just drowning me. And I'm still trying to avoid losing the flat. It came to a point where... I, I, you know, I did want to commit suicide and my anxiety went completely off the rail. And if I didn't have support of my friends, I think I would have done it. The National Leasehold Campaign is a group lobbying to abolish leasehold homes in England and Wales. Together with Silence of Suicide, they surveyed more than 1,150 people about the impact leasehold ownership is having on their mental health. Of the leaseholders who answered the survey, 72% of people said they feel very anxious and worried about their future. More than two thirds said they had feelings of worthlessness as a direct result of their leasehold situation. And more than 90% sometimes feel there's nowhere to turn to for help and support. It's got as bad as it can get, to be honest. You know, I take phone calls daily. Um, I've taken phone calls from people that have wanted to end their lives over this. You know, it's, it's literally the icing on the cake for people. Um, you know, when you've worked really hard for your home that you think that you own, and to have that penny drop moment to realise that you actually own nothing is absolutely devastating. And, you know, people are trapped and they need to be released from this. The House Builders Federation says conditions including ground rents are set out in sales contracts and leases and buyers should receive advice from their legal advisor.
I want to get out. I don't want anything to, to do with these freeholders. They're, they've not been nice to me. They've come in and, and put me in a position where I have anxiety. Um, my antidepressants have um, doubled in dosage uh, because I, 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 sometimes I just can't cope. Gary Bailey bought his Victorian conversion flat in 2006. Initially, he says he was paying about £270 a year for ground rent and management fees. But when the freehold was sold to another freeholder, he received an annual service charge invoice for £1,240. If I pay them, I'm going to be short my mortgage or short bills. So. The, the pressure that's been put on me is is absolutely horrible. The thing is, I had to save for that deposit like anyone buying a freehold property would. Mm. I pay my mortgage exactly the same as somebody that would have a freehold, mm. but I'm treated like a rental tenant. Stories like Lisa's and Gary's have prompted calls for leasehold reform. The Competition and Markets Authority says it will investigate potential unfair terms and claims of mis-selling. And a cross-party group of MPs has called on government to adopt a number of recommendations, including a threshold of £10,000 per leaseholder for major works, and anything above that should be agreed by a majority of leaseholders in the building. Some companies set up as both freeholders and management agents. The agents are people that collect money on behalf of freeholders, even though they don't decide what charges are set. The Association of Residential Management Agents represents firms who choose to sign up to its code of practice. It is for me crying out for regulation. It is crazy that I use myself as an example. I set up with a business partner in a back bedroom and a week later I was handed half a million pounds of somebody else's money and all I had to do was form a company. It should be mandatory to have a license to operate. We believe it should be criminal to operate in that market if you don't have that license to operate. Pebbles here that they shouldn't have and so they blocked the drains. As of yesterday, the government said all new build houses will be sold as freeholds and ground rents on new leases will be reduced to zero. It says it's made it clear that exploitative and unfair leasehold arrangements have no place in a modern housing market. It absolutely drains you and I have to go for an MRI scan. I woke up and my whole left side was numb, I was slurring, I thought I was having a stroke but it's not a stroke. I'm not sleeping, I'm having about three hours sleep. It's affecting my work. By speaking about this, what is it that you want people to understand? What do you want to change? There should be solutions to this. They don't care. Money does talk in this situation. Um, they do pick on vulnerable people because they know they can and there's no support in that. Even though the government now says all new build houses will be sold as freehold, leasehold campaigners say this doesn't help people in existing leasehold homes, like Gary and Lisa. We can talk more about that now with Kate Kendrick, a nurse who started a national campaign against what she says is a leasehold scandal. We're also joined by Carolyn Mendelssohn. She's a leaseholder and shared owner who was evicted from her property when she could no longer afford rising rents and charges. And Carolyn is speaking to us from Israel, which, where she moved when she was made homeless. And we're also joined from our studio in Exeter by Nigel Glenn from the Association of Residential Managing Agents. Welcome all of you. Katie, um, you've carried out this survey. Uh, you're obviously very concerned about how stressful the situation is for some who are affected by leaseholds. Tell us more about some of the situations that, that you've encountered. Well, it's become evident that, you know, the human impact about all of this scandal has been missed in, in the press. And so this, that's why I launched the, the survey, really, to see how it's impacted on people's emotional health and well-being. And it's having huge impacts. I mean, I take phone calls daily from people, um, you know, either wanting to end their own lives or asking me, how can I get out of this? And, it, you know, it's really difficult to tell them what to do or because there's minimal options at the minute for existing leaseholders to, to be able to escape all of these unknown fees and um, the, the stress is unbelievable. I mean, people I mean, have... Oh, sorry to interrupt, because obviously there are millions of people living millions. in leasehold properties yeah. and it works absolutely fine in the majority of cases. Well, you say it works fine, but 
people are yet to have that penny drop moment and it may not be until that unknown bill comes through the letterbox or that you know that they want to sell or need to sell their property that they realize actually this does impact on them and this is what we're trying to do is raise awareness of the bigger leasehold issues that people don't actually realize impacts on them and will impact on their futures let's bring in carolyn carolyn you're in israel yes, now i know because you've you've moved because you were evicted from your home tell us what happened I was indeed. Uh, I purchased a shared ownership over 10 years ago, in 2008, which I thought was my dream come true in a new build. And it seemed at the time it was affordable and everything was going fine. And I moved in the week my first grandson was born. So I was, I was on, on, uh, in heaven. Well, it didn't take very long for everything to start going rising and rising. First of all, there was a raise uh, in the in the. We have to pay three things as shared owners. We have to pay rent, mortgage, and service charges. And initially, when I moved in, the total of the three together came to about eight hundred and ninety pounds, which was doable and fair for enough for London as a one-bedroom flat. So I was ecstatic. Over the years. In fact, just as I moved in, I was told, actually, your service charges are a bit more. And then they were a bit more. And every year, year on year, they became a bit more and a bit more and a bit more until I was 259%. My, just my service charges were, were more than when I moved in. And basically, as the four, 10 years passed, and the services that we received were absolutely nil from the Housing Association. Oh, I'm sorry, at that point, how, how much? You said you were paying 890 a month initially. What did it go up to in total? 1,560 at the last count. And, w and were you seeing anything for those service charges? I wish we were. I wish we were. Uh, all I can say is if, if somebody would go and visit that new build today, it's a slum. Okay, let's bring, in, let's bring in Nigel Glenn, because Nigel, you're from uh, the Association of Residential Man Managing Agents, which effectively acts as an intermediary between landlords and tenants. What's your perspective of, of what's happening in, in some cases, particularly like the ones we were just hearing in our report and, and Carolyn's? Um, it's kind of difficult to go into specifics about it. I mean, mm. service charges are necessary to keep the building in the condition that you'd like to keep it in. It, buildings age just as we do. So, for example, a lift will probably last about 15 years, and when you replace it, it'll cost about £60,000. So you should ideally be putting a bit of money aside um, each year. I think one of the problems that we have is that when people buy into leasehold, I think right at the beginning it should be explained to them what leasehold means, that there will be some service charges. And, and ideally, when you go to an estate agent and you say, I like the look of that flat, the estate agent should be able to say, well, the service charge on that flat is X, the reserve fund is Y, and you know, there'll be some major works over the next four years which will total Z, and then you can make an informed decision. Whereas what tends to happen now is people move into the flat and they're, they're unaware that they, that they have to pay these charges. I, I used to own a managing agent, and the number of times that people would when we'd send a service charge uh, demand out would reply saying, no, I'm sorry, you don't understand, I, I bought my flat, I don't have to take pay these charges and it's awful to have to tell us people you know I'm sorry but you've signed this lease and you, you have to find two or three thousand pounds a year to do to, to pay obviously things. Obviously what you're outlining there are uh, you know legitimate charges that need to be paid at some stage in buildings for upkeep it seems that some of the stories that are being reported go far beyond that do you suspect that there are some companies that are profiteering here what, what is going on how do you explain these suddenly huge bills well that that would be if there isn't a reserve charge and and you'll have to sorry i've got feedback from my earphone which makes uh, talking a little difficult um so if, if the lift does break if you haven't put that four thousand aside for the 15 years then you are faced suddenly with a sixty thousand pound bill to us Many leases are different, uh, well all leases are different, but a lot of them don't allow you to collect reserve funds. What would be sensible is if the government would change that and say it should be part of every building that a, a sensible reserve fund is set and set by an independent third party. So a surveyor would come in, look over the whole building and give you a plan that every seven years you have to redecorate the outside of the building. That's 28,000, you know, every five years, according to Leash, you have to do the interior of the building, that's 5,000, yeah. the lift will last you well, 60, let me, let uh, 15 years, Well, let me put that point then to, so to Katie. Does that sound like a fair way to go forward? 
There's so many unfair, unjustified service charges that people are experiencing that falls with the lease. Everything falls on the leaseholder's lap. And in terms of um, are they needed, uh, you know, people will dispute that these works are needed. But you don't you don't have a relationship with your managing agent because the managing agent works for the freeholder. There's absolutely no requirement to have a freeholder if we have a common hold system. So, you know, it, it's th they're there as... But just on the point of the charges that are being put to to leaseholders and um, uh, Nigel saying effectively if somebody's going to be responsible about it the charges will not be te very low at the begin from the beginning because it's about building up reserve funds. I mean, y well, you know, in the end, know, if there are repairs that we, need to be we done, We understand that people for. need to pay for the upkeep of their building. You know, yeah. you're, not, you're not expecting to get money for nothing. But, but there's so many rogue... The, the industry has just gone rogue and there's far too many people that have been getting away with far too many things for far too long and the ultimate bill lies with the leaseholder all of the time. They talk about, you know, it's written within the lease. Yes, and they, you know, we've got evidence that they have written very cleverly worded leases to maximise what they can claim back off the leaseholder, you know, and we aren't legal experts and we were never told any of this. And, and Nigel was correct in that, that people should be more and open and transparent about it right from the very start. Mm -hmm. But let's, you know, we're in this situation now and people are trapped and we can't get out of it. And, and Nigel, these are companies that are doing it to make money. I mean, what about the idea that, that Katie likes, which is about common hold for flats, which is that it's the residents that decide the residents that are in control and there's absolutely no margin for profiteering in that situation. Well, uh, well, we have similar to common hold at the moment because people can form RTMs where they control their own destiny. They can enfranchise where they buy the freehold out. But if, if we come back to what we're talking about here, which is the major works, that lift is going to die after 15 years, whether it's a common hold, a freehold, an RTM or an RMC. That's it's the physical thing for for the for the building. Now, what you do get is um, if you if you are in control of your own destiny, for for example, you have more say over the contractors. But again, under the Section 20 process, you do have that. Um, okay. So uh, it's a bit difficult to see how you can avoid the charges of an aging building. Carolyn, I mean, ultimately for you, it's a situation that that caused you so much pressure. You you ended can up leaving I just completely. Say about the reserve fund uh, that uh, Nigel was talking about. My building, 33 flats, shared owners have a reserve fund of over a hundred thousand pounds, and yet the building is a slum. So I'm not, I'm not I'm not convinced that the, the reserve fund has got anything to do with this. Thank you all. It is a situation that's being looked at. As we said, the government yesterday uh, made that announcement that all new build homes uh, will not be allowed to be sold with leasehold. And uh, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government has said we've been clear that exploitative and unfair leasehold arrangements have no place in a modern housing market. Uh, we announced the industry pledge and the Competitions and Markets Authority has launched an investigation into leasehold practices. And if you have been affected by issues in this discussion, there's a range of organisation and web organisations